Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cancer. In this video, what we're going to talk about is colorectal carcinoma. And in particular, we're going to look at a model for what happens in colorectal carcinoma. So an actual model that outlines exactly what happens. Now, of course, um, you have to remember, all science is just models uh, for the real world. And um, you might, and this model that I'm going to show you, the Vogelstein model, is very, very simple. And given the complexity that could occur in cancer, uh, you might think that it's over simple. What I will say in the defense of the Vogelstein model is that it's a very simple model, nice and easy to understand. And it actually is remarkably good at um, making predictions, which if you then do experiments and um, an experimental inquiry, basically, the experimental data generally agrees with this model. So it's very, very good. It's a good model, basically. And it's very simple is what's nice about it. Okay, so um, let's begin then. Let's, the way I'm going to structure this, by the way, is we're just going to work through the Vogelstein model and we're going to see the mutations that occur at what point. And uh, whilst when we look at each of the mutations, I will uh, briefly remind you of uh, the pathways that each one is involved in and how that's going to lead to the effect that I claim it has. Okay, and I want hopefully that uh, this um, discussion of the Vogelstein model of colorectal carcinoma will basically um, also help you understand the, uh, the basic principles of all cancer, because a lot of the basic principles that we're going to see here, such as it being a multi-step process, it's not one mutation and then it's cancer, it's a multi-stage process, and the concept of intratumor heterogeneity, I hope that those are going to become apparent in this video. Okay, so let's begin. Let's say here we have the normal epithelium of the colon then. Okay, so let's say these are the um, villi. Let me just... Okay, um, and uh, let's say that... Um, well, actually, they're, they're not villi in the colon. They're colonic crypts, rather, uh, rather than villi. So instead of, um, instead of there being evaginations out of the endothelium, uh, epithelium, instead there's invaginations in, and these are the colonic crypts. Okay, so let's say this is the normal colonic epithelium here. Okay, and these are epithelial cells here. So I'll divide some of them up. And we want to see how you go from having normal epithelial cells to having a, a colorectal carcinoma, or colon cancer. Okay, right. And this is the Vogelstein model for how this happens. So I'll just put that. The Vogelstein model. Right, okay, so let's look at the first thing which happens in the Vogelstein model of colorectal carcinoma. So basically, what has to happen is in a single cell from this colonic epithelium, so this is the colonic epithelium, what has to happen is you have to get a loss of function in, um, you have to get a loss of function in the APC gene, or the adenomatous polyposis coli gene. Okay, so um, let's have a brief reminder of the Wnt beta catenin pathway so that we can understand why a loss of function of the APC um, protein uh, will uh, lead to um, overgrowth of uh, this cell that's going to get this mutation. Okay, so basically, uh, Wnt is a uh, growth-inducing uh, molecule which binds to receptors on uh, the surface of cells. And these receptors consist of two actual proteins that make them up, okay? So one is a, a protein with a single membrane-spanning domain, like so, and the other is a, a protein with a seven-membrane-trans-spanning tran domain. Okay, so this larger one with the seven membrane spanning alpha helices, this is the frizzled receptor. So this is frizzled. And uh, this other receptor that also um, combines with frizzled receptor in order to make this receptor for Wnt, uh, this receptor here is the LRP4 slash 5. So either you can use uh, the protein LRP4 or you can use the protein LRP5. Okay, so together 
LRP4 or 5 uh, with this frizzled receptor, which is often denoted just by FZ. So if you see people referring to FZ, that just means frizzled receptor. Okay, these make up the receptors in the uh, membrane of cells for the Wnt ligand. So frizzled is a seven transmembrane receptor. And finally, let's just color in the um, ligand itself, this Wnt here. Okay, so this is WNT or Wnt. Right, so when Wnt binds to the Wnt receptor, which is made up of this frizzled receptor along with this LRP4 slash 5 protein, what happens is it re the frizzled receptor becomes active and it recruits another protein in here, basically. So let me draw that. Another protein is going to be recruited in here, which unfortunately I've drawn my arrow right through where I wanted to draw the protein. Um, and we'll draw this protein in orange. Okay, so this protein also has a silly name. It's known as disheveled. So this is disheveled. Disheveled. Okay, and um, disheveled is often uh, also uh, referred to as DSH for short. So if you see people uh, referring to DSH, that's what um, it means. It means disheveled. Now, basically, the Wnt signaling molecule is going to lead to the cell uh, receiving a pro, uh, a pro division stimulus. So it's going to promote the division of the cell. And uh, in order to do that, what you need to do is raise levels of beta catenin in the uh, cytoplasm of the cell. So by activating this structure here, this frizzled receptor, well, this winch receptor, um, and then uh, the disheveled, disheveled protein, you somehow need to lead to a rise in beta catenin. So in order to understand how that happens, we need to look at the usual uh, mechanisms uh, which prevent beta catenin from um, elevating in the cytoplasm. So basically, uh, beta catenin is what's known as a transcriptional coactivator, and we'll discuss further later what that means. Uh, and usually to stop beta catenin levels going up in the cytoplasm, there is what is known as a beta catenin destruction complex. So let's have this big scary uh, structure here. Okay, so this is a beta catenin destruction complex. So I will have this in pink. Okay, and basically what the beta catenin destruction complex is going to do is it's going to add a phosphate group onto the beta-catenin molecule over here. And that will target the beta-catenin molecule for uh, ubiquitination. So this is the beta-catenin destruction complex. And it's a complex of loads of proteins, and we're going to see which proteins in a moment. So this is the beta-catenin destruction complex. Okay, right. So as I told you, what it does to beta-catenin is it phosphorylates beta-catenin. So if this is beta-catenin, it's going to stick a phosphate group onto beta-catenin like so. So here's a phosphate group on the side of beta-catenin. And I'm going to colour in beta-catenin. We'll have it in yellow. OK, so beta-catenin in yellow here has now got a phosphate group stuck on the side of it. And once it gets a phosphate group stuck on the side of it, uh, that acts as a group onto which a ubiquitin group can then bind. So this marks it basically for ubiquitination. So the beta-catenin destruction complex itself does not add the ubiquitin group onto beta-catenin. Instead, what it does is it adds this phosphate group onto um, beta-catenin, which can then uh, have a ubiquitin group added onto that. So here is our ubiquitin group being added on to the phosphate group. Okay, right, so I will colour in the um, ubiquitin group here. Okay, so in green. Right, um, so um, things which get ubiquitin added onto them basically get targeted for destruction by the proteasome. So the proteasome recognises this ubiquitin um, molecule and anything that has ubiquitin uh, attached to it, such as now beta-catenin here in yellow, is going to get destroyed by the proteasome. So the proteasome is basically a large tunnel that exists in, um, exists in the cytoplasm of cells and proteins go in one way 
and amino acids come out the other side. So it's going to destroy uh, this beta-catenin, basically. So what will happen is in a usual cell, which is not dividing, beta-catenin will be made, and then the beta-catenin destruction complex will be active, and it will phosphorylate beta-catenin instantly, uh, well, pretty quickly, and uh, then that beta-catenin will get a ubiquitin group added onto it, uh, which is the process known as ubiquitination. Okay, so this is ubiquitination. And then, once it's got the ubiquitin group added onto it, it will then be destroyed by the proteasome. So it won't ever do anything within the cell. Now, this beta-catenin destruction complex, thus, is very important for stopping beta-catenin from doing anything. So let's now look at the proteins which make up the beta-catenin destruction complex. So there are five proteins which make this up, uh, and we'll talk about all five of them. Well, we'll give all their names anyway. So uh, one is something known as glycogen synthase kinase free, or GSK free for short. So this stands for glycogen uh, synthase kinase free. Okay, so you would think that that was involved in uh, metabolism. And indeed, um, glycogen synthase kinase enzymes are involved in metabolism, but they're also, this specific type, this glycogen synthase kinase free, is also involved in this beta-catenin destruction complex. So there's an example of how proteins can perform multiple roles within a cell. Then uh, we have uh, something known as axin, which is another protein. Then we have APC, which is going to be the important one that we're discussing, uh, which stands for adenomatous polyposis coli. So adenomatous polyposis coli. Polyposis coli. Okay? Uh, then we have uh, casein kinase 1 alpha. And sorry, that should have an S in there as well. Sorry. So it's CSK1 alpha, standing for casein uh, kinase 1 alpha. Okay, so the, K, the C and the S come from the casein, and the K then comes from the kinase. And then finally, this one here is something known as PP2A, which stands for protein phosphatase 2A. So this is protein phosphatase 2A. Right, um, so phosphatase 2A. So these five components make up this beta-catenin destruction complex. And basically, what's going to happen is when Wnt uh, binds to its uh, receptor on uh, the surface of the cell, uh, it's going to activate this disheveled protein, and the disheveled protein will then bind to these beta-catenin destruction complexes and inactivate them. So this disheveled protein is going to inactivate the beta-catenin destruction complex. So if the beta-catenin destruction complex becomes inactive, then the beta-catenin isn't going to be phosphorylated, then it's not going to be ubiquitinated, and it's not going to be destroyed. So, beta-catenin will start to build up in the cytoplasm of the cell, therefore, when this beta-catenin destruction complex, um, complex um, goes down, uh, well, the activity of it goes down because it's being inactivated by the frizzled receptor. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.